Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hawkcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by Go Iowa Awesome and Rivals.com. I'm your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by publisher Adam Jacoby and managing editor Ross Binder, as always. Before we get started, if you are listening or watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, drop a like, let us know what you're thinking of the pod while you're listening, drop a comment, and tell us just how damn good Caitlin Clark is because you can never hear it enough. And of course, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, you might be listening, but not subscribed. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, leave that rate and review. Those numbers are going up for us. Of course, we greatly appreciate it. And the more, the merrier. It makes us very happy as well. So we have not potted in about a week. And since Iowa, since then, Iowa defeated West Virginia. That was post that West Virginia win. Since then, they've defeated Colorado in the Sweet 16 and, of course, their 94-87 to victory over LSU in the rematch of last year's title game in the Elite Eight last night. Adam Jacoby, not only our publisher, but our women's beat writer on iowa.rivals.com. He was there in Albany. Though media appeared to not be treated super well, it looked like it went well for you. <laughs> tell us, tell us, I mean, <laughs> the, the experience anyway, the game even watching on TV was was crazy. That is the most I probably I've felt like a fan in a long time in terms of just the heart rate with which was happening during that game uh, and, and how close and how fun it was. Tell us about your experience. Tell us about that game and, and what were the main takeaways from from the win in the Elite Eight? Yeah, it was a tremendous experience. And, and I tweeted at halftime that it was the most intense first half of basketball and let's call it football um the football didn't happen until the fourth quarter but it was the most intense half of basketball that i had ever witnessed and that was full stop true any level male female those two teams were getting after it especially in the first half um lc scored 31 points in the first quarter and then iowa's defense locked down and basically took over the game in the second and third quarters and a big part of that was, of course, Caitlin Clark. And watching that game in the arena, Haley Van Lith could not guard Caitlin. And yet, and yet, Kim Mulkey decided to have Van Lith on the floor for over 30 minutes and just chasing Caitlin around the court the entire time. So some of that's on Van Lith for just not being a good defender. It, it, it was five on four often because all, all Caitlin would do is make one dribble move, make one lateral move. And Van Lith, who was not fast enough for a task like this, not big enough to make up for that difference, was just chasing her, just chasing her around the court. Might get a hand in her face after the ball's five feet gone. But she was not up for it. And yet, Kim Mulkey just never subbed, uh, uh, let's see, it was Flage Johnson onto Clark until the fourth quarter when the game's practically over. And for Iowa fans, that's great. And <laughs> from my perspective, it was great because it meant that Caitlin Clark was going to put on uh, one of the best highlight reel games that I've ever seen. Uh, 37 points, 7 rebounds, 12 assists, and was doing it all was was canning jumpers in everybody's face and she took over the game ross um something you got to add there yeah you shortchanged caitlin she had 41 points 41 points when oh you know what it was the um uh the the last statue that i was uh looking at was from the middle of the third quarter when she still only had 37 41 points uh, so, like, that is the level of dominance that uh, that she was putting on. And and a big part of that was the fact that, again, nobody on LSU could guard Caitlin. Uh, Les Tirpoa, at the very least, could, you know, stay in front of her. And, and it was a, um, you know, valiant effort. But uh, Poa also picked up two first quarter fouls and only played nine minutes the rest of the game. Which was weird because, again, like Van Lith wasn't in foul trouble, but that's because she could never get close enough to Clark to foul her at all. It was it was a drubbing, a uh, as 
as some hip hop artists would call a dog walking. It was dominance, pure and simple. And the fact that Malky did not sub anybody out, like you can say, hey, Van Lis not a very good defender. That's true. You know, everybody knew that coming into the game. Everybody knew that coming into the season. It's not a revelation that Haley Van Lith cannot defend Caitlin Clark. Hell, we saw it last year in the, it was either the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. Like, Caitlin dropped 41 on her in that one, too. So, <laughs> one, yeah, it was going to see Caitlin in her nightmares. For the yeah, rest it was of the Elite Eight last ahead. year also. Yeah. So, she did the exact same thing to Van Lith this year that she did last year. I, I was wondering... You know, Poa picked up the two quick fouls. Uh, you know, she was trying to get some offensive fouls on uh, Iowa players, and the officials were not biting for her uh, her tactics at all, um, which got her in early foul trouble. Do you think LSU didn't switch Johnson onto Clark because they wanted Johnson's offense, and they were worried she'd just tire herself out trying to chase you know Clark around? Or I mean, because that was a strange move not to have her try to defend Caitlin until the fourth quarter when the game was, you know, by that point they were down double digits. Yeah. Caitlin did say in her post game conference that she expected more guarding from Loge than she got, but yeah, that is sort of the balancing act that coaches have to to deal with because again, we saw that Van Lith couldn't guard Clark, but at the very least Van Lith, you know, stayed out of foul trouble enough to chug up 10 shots. She only made two, but she was, you know, able to do that. Johnson, not having to guard Clark, not having to put herself in, um, you know, foul trouble or or at the very least run that risk of foul trouble because, you know, Kate Martin wasn't going to do that to her. You know, she was able to stay on the court and um, and ended up being one of the most um, uh, potent scorers for them. So, yeah, the, the fact that they didn't put Flauge onto Clark meant that they had their leading scorer with 23 points and, and you know, three blocks, uh, had a great game. And does she put up 23 points if she's also chasing Caitlin Clark around the court? Maybe not. Does, you know, so I'm not sure there was a great option for Mulkey there, but I know what was a bad option, and that's what we saw last night. And it's it's the the thing too, and I I think I saw quite a bit of this on Twitter. Is offensively, Haley Van Lith looked like a shell of herself from last season. Mm-hmm. Um, she I don't know. I'd have to look at the stat sheet, and I guess I have it in front of me. But her c- contribution offensively, she's two for ten, one of six from three, yeah. four of four from the free throw line. But those three pointers were just either bad shots or were way off. She did not yeah. look anything like what she what she did at one point. I, I'd say the most impactful players were players that had been at LFCU in Fauge, Johnson, and Angel Reese in the first half. Now, Anissa Morrow yeah. had some contributions, but that mid-range shot she was taking pretty frequently was not working at all. Um, and yeah. she was she was somebody that Iowa fans wanted out of the portal last year uh, from DePaul. Of course, she did end up at at LSU. But second half, Angel Reese just was not not anywhere near what she was in the first half. She still finished with uh, what was her final point total? Seventeen points, I think, is what I'm trying to find here. Twenty rebounds, ten on offense. Yes, twenty rebounds, and she was. Oh, Go ahead. She was dominant before that, uh, before turning her ankle in the camera well. And to some extent, she was dominant afterwards too, but her offense left. uh, She wasn't quite as explosive. And you could especially see it when she was sort of walking up and down the court whenever she got the chance. When, When she didn't have to run in transition, she didn't run in transition. And we know enough about her that that wasn't just for funsies. You know, that was sort of a reflection of how she was feeling. But, uh, you know, nobody took the bait on that as a contributing factor in the uh, post-game uh, interviews that we did, either on the dais or in the locker rooms. Um, and part of that was, you know, she came back in and immediately scored off an offensive rebound. 
And she got most of her offensive rebounds after um, uh, the the injury. The thing of it is, though, she went one for 10 in the second half from the field and only two for six from the foul line, which was especially jarring because she's she's not horrible. She's not Shaq. So clearly affected somehow. But she was also affected by the presence of Addie O'Grady. And O'Grady was the only person on that Iowa roster who had any shot of slowing her down. And she stepped up in a moment where we're going to find out that there were, anyone want to take a guess? I'm going to guess it's going to be at least eight digits. I, somewhere between 13 and 15 million people were watching that game. It's going to be my guess. She stepped up in front of them, in front of God, in front of everybody, and completely changed the game for a future WNBA first round pick. And after the season she's had, after the trouble that she's had uh, integrating with the whole Caitlin Clark ecosystem on offense, for her to step up in that moment, to, to not take that uh, opportunity to sort of pack it in and say, hey, this isn't a good fit for me. Uh, that's the difference between Iowa winning and losing this game, quite frankly. Uh, that was a game-changing performance by Eddie O'Grady, nothing less. And if... And, you know, now it's going to be Aliyah Edwards in the final four. And if Iowa gets past UConn, it's going to be Camila Cardoso in the uh, in the championship game in all likelihood. So, you know, like, congrats on that one WNBA first rounder. Uh, here's two more women who are going to be picked above her next year <laughs> or, or, or more accurately in a couple months. So, like, hey, it's not going to get easier. But she has this experience, and it didn't start with Angel Reese. It started last year against Aaliyah Boston in the uh, in the semifinal game. And Aaliyah Boston, you know, future first overall pick, future teammate of Caitlin Clark in all likelihood. O'Grady goes in there, gives him 10 minutes, uh, blocks one of um, Boston's layups, plays great defense. And, every, and, you know, this was a game where everyone expected Monica Zanano to be the like uh, I was big weapon on the interior, uh, both offensively and defensively. Zanano was hampered by the fact that she was just not as tall, not as vertical. O'Grady was. And so O'Grady's been through that. She's, <laughs> I, there's not a whole lot of players that can say that they've played double digit minutes against a big who's better than Angel Reese, but O'Grady's done it and, and on a, a similarly huge stage. So this was not new for her. And, and this sort of like, well, all right, I know we're playing a big team, like, and, and, and I mean, like, vertically big. I know we're playing a team with a bunch of posts. I know that my num my name's almost certainly going to get called, and so she stayed ready and uh, didn't have to get ready. And, you know, she, she played 15 extremely impactful minutes to the point where she got a standing ovation on one of her subs out. And, and it wasn't even the final sub out of the game. It was just a... Oh my, it, like, I think it was the middle of the third quarter and, and the fans recognized what a difference she was making. And, and it is not a coincidence that O'Grady, as soon as she got switched onto Reese, and again, Reese was still productive, Reese's offense goes in the gutter. One for 10 in the second half. And one thing that O'Grady said was, I'm just pushing her around. Like, I'm not letting her push into me. I'm going to for, I'm going to make her uncomfortable with my length. And I'm going to make her shoot that mid-range shot that she doesn't like. I think that was the exact phrasing from O'Grady. And uh, it worked. It worked like gangbusters. So that was the game changer for me. And to do that when Iowa is counted out because of their quote-unquote lack of interior presence. Yeah. yeah. To do that. Well, and, and like you mentioned, uh, Iowa fans wanted Morrow. And, and you could see why during that game. The, her talent is undeniable. And again, like she too, like she, she's, I think Morrow's 6'2", 6'3". She, she's not huge. She's not 6'7", or anything like that. But I, I think she too is a future uh, WNBA talent. Uh, or and, and if not, then the WNBA needs to expand. Because like she should be a future pro. Uh, but, but I think what we saw ultimately was that LSU played like less than the sum of their parts Monday night. And Iowa played like more than some of their parts. Iowa played like a team, shockingly, 
that has been playing with each other for years and years and, and, and can make those like ESP, like I don't have to look to know where you are sorts of passes or plays or this or that. You did not see that cohesion from LSU. And one of those plays was to Addison O'Grady. It was damn near full court pass from Caitlin Clark to Addison O'Grady, who really hasn't played as much as we thought she was going to play this year. Hannah Stolke is usually the go-to when running the floor. And Caitlin hit her in stride for an easy layup. That, when I talk about being able to, or yeah, I guess being able to watch that game more or less as a fan, just of basketball, I was watching it with with my girlfriend and I'm going, holy crap, you know, uh, with a few different words there. With that pass and that other one that that Caitlin threaded the needle to Sydney a Fulter in transition for the layup, beauty. Yeah. Like, how do you not love this? Is art in a different expression? How do you not love to watch this game of basketball with Caitlin Clark as the point guard for Iowa? Because it was beauty in motion. The I'm glad you brought up that that transition pass to a Fulter because with the angle, I, if we're talking about the same one, and, and and let's sort of back up and and marvel at the fact that I'm not quite sure which incredible pass to a Fulter you're talking about from this one game, but if it is the same one, and I think it is, the angle of it was perfect. That it basically was coming right toward where I was sitting, um, courtside. Like that was just sort of the angle of the pass. And so all all I'm seeing is this ball just rocketing straight for us. And again, with the way that Caitlin plays, she's throwing passes before that window opens. She's throwing it to where Fulter's going to be. And she knows that, like, and this is someone who's sprinting, right? And 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 Caitlin is also like in full sprint too. The fact that she's able to deliver that dime at uh, approximately, uh, my my iPhone has a, a radar gun. People don't know that. Uh, approximately three hundred miles an hour, and still puts it right on the money. I mean, it was incredible. And 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 just to see it like coming more or less like it it was never more than thirty feet away. But like just that perspective of it. I was and then O'Grady swoops in <laughs> into view. You know, takes the pass and, and takes it. In and it's like, oh, like. TV can't prepare you for that kind of speed, that kind of I, I, just the whole controlled chaos of an Iowa basketball game and an Iowa transition game. It is lightning fast. It will make your head spin. And if you don't have your head up, especially as a defender, you're useless. There's nothing you can do about that because, again, they've been playing together for years. They have been running this transition for years. They've been coached by Lisa Bluter and Jan Jensen, Raina Harmon, Tania Davis, and the rest of them, uh, Abby Stamp, for years. And so they're they're almost speaking their own language, um, I, a language that twins teach each other, I, I think is the, the, uh, the old line. Um, but LSU, for all their talent, is not cohesive in that way. LSU was not, like... It almost didn't matter because Angel Reese could just, you know, grab rebounds above everybody and put things back in. And she was great at that. And she's going to make some WNBA centers look pretty silly at the next level, too, for a while. Like, that's Asia Wilson 2.0 right there. I Let's take nothing away from Angel Reese as a basketball player. But Iowa knew how to neutralize that. And a big part of that was just, hey, we're going to run them off the floor. That was their game plan. That's what they executed, and it worked. Speaking of which, you mentioned all these these players at Iowa sticking together and, and being on the same team for years. Well, Sydney Fulter and Kate Martin showed that last night and scored in the way that Iowa needed them to. I know that's something we've talked about before. Ross, seeing what they did last night and how they contributed – I think they both shot 50% from the field. How, I mean, like, how important was that to you for Iowa to have some success last night and beat LSU? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Iowa needed somebody to step up. You know, as great as Caitlin was last night, 41 points, 12 assists, 7 rebounds, she still can't do it by herself. You know, she does need somebody else. She needs, 
at least, you know, two other players, it, it feels like have to have good games also for Iowa to win these games against, you know, these heavyweight opponents like LSU and, and like they have coming up with UConn and South Carolina. And last night, you know, the, those two players were Kate Martin and a Folter, Sydney, Folter. They were phenomenal. Kate Martin had 21 points and 16 of them after halftime, which was huge. Um, yeah, Caitlin had the 12 points in the third quarter, I think all on, all on threes. Uh, but Martin was, you know, kind of the yin to, to Clark's yang, just, you know, doing a little bit here and there, just, you know, she was on the end of some passes. Uh, she was hitting some, you know, passes in transition. She was getting a, a few putbacks. She was even like attacking off the dribble and, and getting some shots over LSU defenders, which don't know that I would have expected that too much, but you know, Kate Martin was in his own in the second half last night and, Iowa needed that badly and, and they got it. And then a Folter, I mean, she's just been phenomenal since, you know, everyone was, was super concerned about how Iowa handles the absence of Molly Davis. And, you know, obviously the Folter is a different player than Davis doesn't play the same type of game, but she's had an incredible impact with the way she does play. And, you know, her, her ability in transition is phenomenal. And, uh, her ability in the half court has also been great. And she's, you know, an effective, you know, catch and shoot. Uh, she's been another really good three point option for Iowa uh, and which, you know, they need for a team that likes to shoot threes like they do. Uh, and, you know, she's just, you know, got that dog in her, like they say, you know, she is, she's the hustle play, you know, queen. She's diving on the floor to get loose balls. She's careening out of bounds and, you know, doing whatever, uh, she has to do. And yeah, I mean, those were the two splashiest, um, you know, co-stars. Obviously we talked about O'Grady. She didn't have the big stat line, but played tremendous. Uh, Gabby didn't have a big stat line I, either, but again, her, her just defensive pressure and harassing opponents is always just a huge part of how Iowa can be successful. Uh, but yeah, last night, you know, the big, you know, kind of, it's, it's kind of rude to call them second bananas, but you know, the, the co-stars, I guess is a better way to put it were, were Martin and a Folter and, and they were excellent. Uh, Adam, you were going to add something there. Yeah. The, one of the things that I was sort of uh, a little bit concerned about uh, with a Folter being more or less the uh, replacement for Molly Davis in the, uh, not only in the starting lineup, but uh, as a role player in the offense, Ross, like you said, they, they don't really exactly play the same style of ball. But what we saw in the first three rounds, especially was, and, and even going back to the Big Ten tournament, was a Fulter was spending a lot more time with the ball in her hands, dribbling, distributing, even bringing it up to court. And I had been a little bit concerned about that because we had seen, like, the turnover numbers weren't quite there, but we had seen some of those earlier teams cause a little bit of disruption with the Iowa transition, slow it down at the very least by pressing a Fulter when she has the ball in the open court. And what we know about LSU, what we know about Kim Mulkey, you know, especially going, uh, like what we saw from them last year, was that they will try to take a strength and make it a weakness. And if they see a weakness, a button they can push, they will push, 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 push. And that is often the difference between winning and losing. So in this game, we didn't see a Folter with the ball in her hands as much. I think she only finished with one assist and didn't really bring the ball up the court very often, which probably made Mulkey a little bit upset because that was one opportunity to cause a little bit of havoc that they didn't really get to materialize. And the rest of her game was tremendous. Uh, you know, LSU tried to play a little bit of physical ball, especially in the second half. You're not going to scare Sid a Folter with physicality. You're not. You're not going to scare her with big lights. She is one of the most confident players on the team, especially ones that aren't wearing number 22. Uh, like, she's been ready for this. She has waited her turn, and she is not letting go of this opportunity. I'm sure that's a Hamilton lyric or something. Um, but, like, she was ready. She was locked in. Uh, her, her final stats, uh, you know, 16 points against LSU, five rebounds. Um, and again, physical defense against, 
a team that was really tall. Uh, she had spent a few times on the interior against Reese. That was unfair, right? Like Reese is bouncier and about four, five, six inches taller than her. It, that it, that was not a fair matchup, which is why O'Grady was uh, such a great sub in. But when a Fulcher was able to play to her strengths and, you know, sort of be that like, there's a ball on the ground. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to, I'm running to this open spot. I'm going to knock down this three when you give it to me. Uh, you know, that was a perfect melding of the Molly Davis role and the Sita Folter strengths. And that goes back to coaching. That goes back to making sure that these women are put in position to succeed. Uh, again, shout out to Raina Harmon. Um, I, I did have to ask uh, Coach Jay after the game who had the um, scout for LSU. Because I, I thought it might be her. Uh, it, for for a big ticket team like this, but no, they gave it to Reina and Iowa executed it to practical perfection. Guys, they didn't even need to call a timeout until the last minute of the game when they were up by twelve. So, uh, on a game plan where they are saying we're going to run LSU off the court, and and just let that one sink in too. Their game plan was to run LSU and Kim Mulkey off the court and it worked and they didn't even need a timeout while the game was in doubt to adjust anything uh coach Blair did say that she thought about it in the second quarter when things started to like waver a little bit but Iowa righted the ship without her help and that was basically it um that is a tremendous um like something that uh that's what I'm looking for a um tremendous accomplishment uh, by the coaches, tremendous execution by the players. And like, that is how you earn your way to the final four. It, it's Iowa got a little bit lucky with the matchups last year has not really gotten lucky this year and will continue to not get lucky this year. And they're earning it. And I think that is more satisfying for Iowa fans than the, you know, sort of the novelty, the, Oh, things are working out. Oh, like, is this really happening uh, of last year? Like that was cool. That was fun to cover, but it it felt impermanent. <clears throat> this felt different. This felt like Iowa was the one seed. Iowa was the big dog in the yard. Iowa was the one saying, this is how the game's going to go. You're playing at our pace. We're not playing at yours. Malky hated the fact that LSU scored 31 points in the first quarter because it meant that they were playing at Iowa's pace. And for a team that has basically a six-and-a-half player rotation – they couldn't sustain it, and especially once Angel Reese uh, hurt her ankle, they didn't sustain it. And Iowa, like, the final margin was seven points. It was 14 points at the end of, like, with one minute left. Iowa took control of that game in the second half with pace, with consistency, with effort, with intensity, and honestly with great defense. And, and Caitlin Clark just absolutely barbecuing anybody that got put in front of her. You have to think, too, regarding the amount of missed shots that LSU had last night. I'll, I'll tell you a stats lot. here. They they shot 34 of 88 from the field, 38.6% from the field. That's not good. So I will say I thought, like I mentioned, Haley Van Lith, Anissa Morrow, some strange shot selection, and I think that's a byproduct of individuals as opposed to team. But when you're talking about this up and down pace, that takes the legs out from underneath oh, yeah. who have been playing and playing multiple games within however many days. And they don't have that deep of a rotation. They played six girls played double digit minutes. And that's the same for Iowa, but they could still get Kylie Fearbach in there. They still got AJ Ediger in there. So and they would have had Molly Davis, too, for, you know, if if she were healthy. But um, I, I, I think it's a masterclass that maybe wasn't even intended by that get up and down. Cause I was used to that LSU, maybe not so much. Russ, before your point, let me just add something real quick to that. I, I Elliot, I think the difference here is that I, I talked to a guy who covers uh, sports down in, in Louisiana, shout out to Pat Netherton. Um, I, I won't tell you what school he covers because Iowa fans will not appreciate it. Uh, especially ones who were paying attention in 2006. We'll put it that way. But Netherton uh, told me, this is what LSU's been doing all year. It's like one big and, and one guard off the bench. But like seven player rotations have been their thing all year. Whereas Iowa, you know, even with Molly Davis out, yeah, the, the actual bench production 
from Iowa was not a whole lot more than LSU's, it, both in terms of minutes and, and like points on the board. But Iowa had more bench players that they trust than LSU did. LSU's level of trust only went six or seven players deep. Iowa's been happy to go 10 players deep all year. And so the fact that they knew that they could, if Gabby couldn't play all 40 minutes, like like if her legs needed a break, or, or if Caitlin, you know, they could have gone deeper in the rotation. They just didn't have to. And again, credit to the coaches. All right, Ross, sorry, I, I stepped on you there. Yeah, I was just going to note, you know, piggybacking on what Elliot said about LSU getting tired and, you know, you could see it in their, in their legs. Like they were not, they didn't have the same bounce in the second half that they had in the first half. And I think that was partly the tempo. I think that was, you know, they talk about the demoralizing effect of Kaylin Clark's threes and she put on a flurry in the third quarter when Iowa built that double digit lead. And I think that was really, uh, you know, that, that has an effect too. And, you know, they get down double digits and they're down double digits for a good chunk of the second half. And they, they, they're not making any, any dent in that lead. Uh, the other thing was, you know, I thought for Iowa's defense, anytime they held LSU to a, a three pointer or even a mid range jumper, I was like, that's a win for Iowa because it's not going to be a good rebounding opportunity for them. And they were in the first half, you know, in the, the first quarter, early part of the second, like they really did a number on Iowa's, you know, on the offensive glass. Like they were just literally just grabbing the ball over top of Iowa players and putting it back in. And the more they did that, the more I was like, oh boy, this is a matchup Iowa just doesn't have an answer for essentially. And, but they kind of went away from that. And like, you know, if Anissa Moro shooting mid range jumpers, great because she's not going to get an easy putback when she's doing that. If Angel Reese, you know, wants to shoot an elbow jumper, okay, that's fine. That's not a high mm -hmm. percentage shot. And it also kind of felt like a little correction, or I guess the odds evening out for last year uh, in the title game where LSU was just smoking hot, especially on three-pointers. I mean, they had, I don't remember her name, but there was the, the woman who came off the bench and hit like seven threes in the game, and she'd hit like, Five the entire season i wish i could remember her name but you know she just had the game of her life and uh it, you know in the best possible moment for it and last night yeah that that was not happening lsu was not hitting uh outside shots so uh yeah elliot did you want to add something there i was just going to reference the rebounding discrepancy the offensive rebounding discrepancy because it's not something that's been talked about a lot as far as i can tell and with you addressing it there LSU had 23 offensive rebounds to Iowa's six. And Iowa still won. Yeah, that, yeah that's that's why LSU shot 19, yeah, what, 20, uh, yeah, 19 more shots. It's because they, they gathered so many of them. The, uh, the what was their second chance points, though? I mean, did, were they? 14. 14. Yeah. 23 yeah, offensive 14. rebounds. 14 second chance points and a big part of that was again angel reese yeah uh reese had seven offensive rebounds in the second half one field goal that that seems borderline impossible but in the especially in that second half and especially with Addie o'grady on her like reese was able to get rebounds over o'grady uh maybe not quite as reliably as she got them over like Hannah Sulky, Kate Martin, who are just like not tall enough for a task like that. But when Reese has that ball in her hands, <clears throat> presumably close enough to the rim that she can go back up with it, holding her to one for 10 is either a reflection of her ailing ankle, or it's a reflection of the defense that I was playing on her uh, being disruptive with the ball. Uh, you know, it's a reflection of a lot of those things. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, Iowa can't have a whole lot more games. Uh, mm -hmm. well, one, there's only two games left, but usually any game where I was giving up offensive rebounds on 43% of the opponent's misses and only gathering 16% of its own misses on the O class. Normally that's not a recipe for success, but again, it goes back to Caitlin Clark. It goes back to Addie Grady. Oh, Grady. 
Uh, it, it goes back to Kate Martin in her 16 second half points and essentially just helping run LSU off the floor. I mean, the fact that Martin made you know scored all those points and did it with pace uh there there was even one point where uh ross like you mentioned she was attacking off the dribble and and she hit this beautiful fadeaway jumper right in front of us uh any guesses who she hit that jumper over anyone want to toss out an idea who kate martin might have just smoked off the dribble for a for a, a step back shot any guesses was it angel reese no 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 Oh, no, oh, no. It was, it was Haley Barbecue Manley. Chicken herself. Yes, it was. Right. Barbecue, 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 Barbecue Chicken, chicken herself. <laughs> oh, Cajun, okay. Cajun cooking, Popeyes. Barbecue chicken. Like, she was she was miserable out there. Miserable. I, I, I can't think, like, she has got to regret, uh, like, if she wanted out of Louisville, fine. But she probably picked the worst place to transfer. If she's trying to get away from Caitlin Clark and get away from giving up 41 points and 12 rebounds in, in you know, the Elite Eight, because it's all happening again. And there was nothing she could do about it except just shrug. Like, what was amazing to me, guys, and, and I'm not sure that I've really seen this uh, mentioned elsewhere, but, you know, when Michael Jordan was canning all those threes. He had to do the shrugging himself. Normally when Caitlin's, uh, you know, canning a bunch of threes, she's doing the shrugging herself. We saw not only Van Liff, but Reese shrugging to the bench after Caitlin's threes last night. That is the level of dominance that Clark had, where even their defenders are like, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do about this? Van Lith was not put in position to succeed. And and for as decorated a coach as Mulkey is, for as tremendous a motivator as she is, for as smart a basketball mind as she is, she, she's got the hardware to prove it. Like, I'm not asking anybody to, like, like her. I'm not asking anybody to endorse anything that's ever come out of her mouth. But she knows basketball. And the fact that Van Lith just stayed getting cooked for 30 minutes, 30 minutes and 37 seconds, Last year, Poa could at the very least stay in front of Clark more or less. She picked up those fouls, like she had two fouls in six minutes in the first quarter, only played nine minutes after that, but finished with three fouls. How do you not have Poa at the very least foul herself out, at the very least disrupt what I was trying to do? Haley Van Lith was not disruptful for Iowa's offense at all. And, and so when Iowa is not only making their shots, but playing their game the way that they want to play, right, like... like Hannah didn't have a great game against Reese, but uh, Alfolter was playing the way she wanted to play. Martin was playing the way she wanted to play. Clark was playing the way she wanted to play. Uh, Gabby was playing tremendous defense, and, and LSU wasn't able to stop her from doing that. Uh, hell, Addie O'Grady played the way that she wanted to play. That When I was doing all that, they are incredibly difficult to beat, and especially when uh, Caitlin's shooting 45% from downtown. Her first time, guys – shooting over even 40% in a game from downtown since they detonated Minnesota at the barn back in February. That was the first time that she had done that. So uh, word to the rest of the NCAA, if Kate, if this counts as a slump for Caitlin Clark and she's out of it now, heading into the final four, uh, good luck, Paige. Good luck, Don Staley in South Carolina. Like this is, we're going to get some cinema next week. Adam. I think we're going to get, You've you've been at a lot of games this year, so you've got to see Caitlin, you know, fairly up close. Did she, did she seem different, you know, last night before the game or in warmups or anything? Like, did you think like, oh, this is going to be a big Caitlin game just from the jump? Or, you know, it was weird because when I was walking over and, and I was watching warmups, and and some of it was just sort of like bad luck with how other players' shots were bouncing this and that. I mean, you know how warmups go, but. Of the, I, I would say of the Caitlin shots that I filmed, just you know, to to have and and maybe put on social. I think she hit maybe 20, 30 percent of her three pointers. Uh, like a lot of them were missing, and and some of them were missing not close. But I also only watched a few minutes of it, and and uh, uh, Chad Lysico, uh the registers great beat writer, um, 
he had mentioned like his characterization of uh, on his little text line was uh, that she looked on fire in warm ups. So I, I probably just saw a couple, um, you know, ineffectual uh, minutes of shooting from her. And I'm sure that she has those every game. Uh, she did have sort of a Zen calmness to her. Uh, you know, she one was never going to take the bait on like LSU revenge and this and that. And like, we, 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 we can tell, and we know that she doesn't like to feed into that like conflict and discourse to begin with, but she also didn't take any real opportunities to like hand it back to Reese. She, she didn't get, she didn't lose her composure. Didn't even really come close. And even when she didn't get some calls, like she got knocked down on some plays and no whistle and like, Big Ten refs and and especially Carver Hawk Arena, they would have been obvious fouls. And you know, some of it's just that hey, you know, it's the Elite Eight. <laughs> Go out there and play big girl basketball. Like that, that's always been the case, and that has nothing to do with Iowa or these refs or those refs or this or that. Like that's tournament basketball. Um, didn't like she would glower <laughs> she might she might sit on the ground an, uh, an extra second or two to be like hey you, you see me knocked down here you know i didn't do this to myself right like but but by and large she was calm she was prepared and and, and you know i i think there weren't a whole lot of instances where she had anything to be upset about because again she's cooking van lift and monkey refuses to put anybody else on her and and so when you're put into position to succeed by the opposing coach, nothing to complain about. Like, <laughs> go out there and execute. And that's exactly what she did. And that's why I was going to the final four. Like, what was there to complain about? She was playing five on four all night long, or, or at the very least for 30 minutes and 37 seconds. Yeah, I mean, her, her demeanor definitely did seem, you know, like she was a little bit calmer and more locked into the game than – you know, was it the Iowa City games where she just seemed a little, you know, amped up and kind of going out, hey, ref, I didn't get this or that or whatever. And she was just a little, you know, the fire was running pretty hot, it seemed like, in those games, I think. And this one, yeah. she was just really seemed very focused on, like you said, cooking Haley Van Lith. That's where she directed her fire to, obviously. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Direct I was heat. Do you guys know how to share screen on Zoom? Because I was going to show you a meme that made me think of Caitlin and how she was last night. I've been uh, start share, so shift um, control S at least on my Apple, but it will be under the meeting menu. We'll fix this in post. Okay, will we? Well, anyway, I was going to show the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to show the LeBron James twenty sixteen meme because that's what I've been thinking of of. Yeah, Caitlin Clark, um, him with the headphones on when they're down three one to the to the Warriors. That's what I'm going for. Uh, that's that's just the vibe that I've gotten from her, and I, I think we saw it last night. And I mean, that's just that's just Pete Caitlin, and she might never say it. She might not even allude to it being a revenge game or anything like that. But I mean, that competitive fire that girl has, like. You could take her for for a word on that, but she does an excellent job with the media too, and not feeding into that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. the competitiveness with which she plays, like you have to think that was on her mind, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. For sure. it, it, and again, she was not going to take the bait. She she was not going to like turn this into Caitlin versus Angel again, and and partly because of that Wright Thompson piece. Like we know what its whole having it become a very much not about basketball last year that took a toll on her because Caitlin is very much all about basketball. And to the extent that she's ever expressed any sort of political view, it's, it's been pro title nine because it's pro basketball, right? Like it, it serves her purpose there. And, and that, and, and she doesn't turn it into a larger agenda here. She doesn't turn it into a larger agenda there. It drives some folks crazy, but ultimately it means that her focus is on the, game and the way that she was able to dominate this game kept it about basketball no drama save it for your mama but just 40 minutes of high intensity competition got the win got to celebrate all that and and i, I mean guys you, you saw my pregame thing it was about the basketball and that's all i wanted it was a fairly played game iowa earned the win took home the win like the refs didn't turn it this way or that 
Yeah, she was absolutely locked in. I think she's going to be locked in for this UConn game. And ultimately, like, there is a mutual respect, a, a deep mutual respect between Iowa and UConn, Bluter, Oriema, Clark, Bukers, like, all four of those deeply, deeply respect each other. Like, this, there is not going to be a whole lot of animosity on that court on Friday night. But there is going to be a lot of high, high-level basketball. Yeah, like, oh, you, you guys thought Iowa LSU was high-level basketball. It was. Iowa UConn is going to be cinema. That is like I I'll go ahead and say this. Two of the three best coaches in college basketball are going to be facing off against each other on Friday. I I, I think the top tier in college basketball, sorry LSU fans, the top tier in college basketball, women's college basketball, is Oriana, Staley, Bluter. I think Mulkey is one B. And proved it last night because Bluter, like like we we talk about Clark dominating Van Lith, Bluter did the same thing to Mulkey, like and, and, and Iowa staff did the same thing to LSU staff. I think I think that might be the more accurate way to put that, especially because we're talking about a game with a really tight turnaround, uh, forty eight hour turnaround. So we are talking about the best, some of the best coaching in college basketball is going to be on display. <laughs> How you don't get up for that is is beyond me. Like, if you like college basketball, you better be watching Friday night. Uh, and and yeah, ultimately, this is a challenge. This is going to be great to watch. And I, I think Caitlin is going to be as up for this as any game of her career, up to and including last year's tournament run. She is going to be focused. And listen, she's got a lot of respect for UConn. She's got a lot of respect for Paige. She's got a lot of respect for Gino. Like, there's no animosity or anything like that. But we know she remembers that UConn didn't really recruit her. And UConn was basically the only school that didn't really recruit her. You know, they, they sent her some stuff, but she never talked to Gino during recruiting. And again, thanks to Wright Thompson's profile for, you know, putting that on the record. But she knows. She remembers. Like, this, this will – she won't have forgotten – and uh, I, I think it's going to be a very, very special performance on Friday because she she steps up to these moments all the time. So before we delve too much into the, again, that competitive fire and, and the lack of recruitment from UConn, you might have to correct me here. This might just be ignorance of, of the history of women's basketball, but could this be marketed i don't know that it will be it'll be more so caitlin versus page right but could this very well be marketed goat versus goat in gino oriema being the greatest women's basketball coach of all time versus caitlin who is arguably the greatest women's basketball player of all time i don't i don't think there's a really an argument like just i test it and you know stats test it and everything else and her ability to shoot i mean could could this be considered goat versus goat you know obviously coach player well i'll tell you this much gino thinks caitlin's the goat so all these talking heads and bozos that have been trying to knock clark down a notch for not having a ring uh if, if gino ariama himself won't even take that bait then frankly I'm, I'm not really concerned what Stephen a smith or any you know anyone who's never played the game or coached the game has to say about that uh even jay williams like buddy you played on duke like <laughs> You were thrown to Mike Dunleavy Jr. Basketball is a team sport. And Caitlin, if Caitlin's ever going to get hardware, it's not ultimately going to be just about how good she is. You can't ride one player, especially in 2024. You can't ride one player to a national championship. And you can't not incorporate them and try hard to incorporate them with the rest of your team, bring the rest of your team's talent up and expect to win it, it has to be intentional it, it it like caitlin's greatness is so self-evident that if all you want to do is bring it back to rings then like okay just say that you haven't been watching her play just 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 go ahead and say that and spare the those of us who have been watching her all season multiple seasons we know it gino ariama knows it coaches across america know it it is so self-evidently true that what Caitlin is doing has not been touched by anybody else. And if, if it had, 
they would hold the records that Caitlin has, <laughs> right? Like the record books reflect her singular greatness. And you go ahead, argue with the record books all you want. Leave us out of it because we know the truth. And yeah, goat versus goat, absolutely. Because I, one, Oriama already thinks Caitlin's the goat. And two, I would wager Bluter thinks if she doesn't think Gino's a goat, it's only because there's Pat Summit or it's only because there's, um, you know, Vivian Stringer. Like she, she might have some, you know, personal reasons to, to not say that. But I, I think in terms of objectively, in terms of accomplishments, it's Gino and Pat Summit, A1 or, or uh, you know, 1A, 1B, and they occupy that top all time tier by themselves, I would say. So, yeah, goat versus goat absolutely fair uh hey espn get on that <laughs> and you better damn credit me for it that's all i'm saying that's right trademark i'm pretty sure zoom has a uh a, that's legally binding if you do it on zoom so with yes. this game ahead obviously uh, folks know the history of uconn being traditionally if not the best basketball program of all time, women's basketball program of all time, right up there with the Tennessees uh, of the world. And you have to think South Carolina is going to be considered up there sooner rather than later. But what do we know about this UConn team? How does Iowa match up with them? Um, Adam, I, I imagine Ross, you, you've got some contributions here, but, but we'll start here with, with Adam and and see where we go. Yeah. Uh, I, I think in, in terms of, uh, go, um, you know, programs, UConn is unquestionably the best college basketball program, men's or women's, of the 21st century. That much, I think, everybody can agree on. Uh, in, in terms of what the Huskies can actually bring, it it has to start with Paige Buchers. And, and Paige was, uh, people like to draw comparisons between Buchers and Clark for, for a lot of good reasons. But uh, Buchers was also sort of the reason that, um, UConn didn't recruit Caitlin uh, because, you know, at, at that point, the how you have two of those same players on the same team, one, it's a little tough to recruit to sort of like alpha ball dominant scores uh, at that time. And, and then also uh, like in, in terms of like being a satisfactory place for them to land with their own aspirations because um, they're not thinking about, well, I'm going to have to play with great players in the WNBA. They're thinking I'm trying to play in college. Uh, but, but that all said, um, Buchers, especially coming back from her injury, which has really made her into a different, more uh, well-rounded player. She's not quite as explosive. She's pretty close still though. Like she has recovered quite well. And, and her stats are amazing. 22 points, five rebounds, four assists. But here's where it gets especially amazing because she, with the injuries that um, UConn has suffered multiple uh, over the course of the year, just in terms of getting five competitive players on the floor, like the five best players on the floor, Buchers has played a lot of like three and four, like like almost a Kate Martin type role for the team. And so she leads a team in steals with uh, 2.3 a game, which is rather bonkers. And leads the team in blocks so you know Buchers is almost certainly like one she's big like Clark she's she's a 6-0 guard and and has those like dominant dribble skills like open court you're you're not those two Clark and Buchers are absolutely going to be going at it and it is going to be a tremendous matchup a tremendous matchup and and you hope that they're both able to put in 40 minutes of good, hard, honest competition, uh, you know, let the best player win. And that's, that's that. Uh, but, you know, UConn is also not just her because there's also Aaliyah Edwards, who is um, like we mentioned earlier, projected to be a first round pick and probably a top five pick in this year's WNBA draft. Uh, she is not quite as I, I think I mentioned this earlier. She's she's not the like she's only six three. She so she's not the six seven like behemoth like math problem you can't solve that like Cardoso is. But she's super productive. We're talking eighteen points, nine rebounds. Um, 
you know, doesn't take a whole lot of bad shots, doesn't try to do too much, like doesn't try to be a player that she's not. So like that's going to be a tough matchup too. Um, Ashlyn Shade is another uh, scorer for, you know, she's a backcourt contributor for the, for the Huskies. And, you know, like her contributions are, you know, 36% from deep. So you can't just like leave her open. But yeah, there are some players on that team uh, that UConn's going to be missing. Uh, I, I've never known how to pronounce this. Uh, AZ or AZ Fudd, um, who was named after the um, old uh, Stanford point guard, uh, got hurt like two games into the year. And and she would like a backcourt with Paige and, uh, and again, uh, and Fudd. <laughs> uh, that would have been a tremendous challenge for Iowa's backcourt. And and I think Clark and Gabby would have been up for it, like, but it, it, it would have been even tougher for the Hawkeyes. So uh, on some level, Iowa's not getting UConn at quite 100%, but at the same time, a lot of UConn's injuries that have happened happened long enough ago that they have already adjusted their game plan. Like they 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 already know how to play to their strengths. And of course, Gina Oriana can, you know, put together a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, uh, a, a, along with the best of them. So, yeah, I mean, we're we're talking about UConn. We're we're talking about a team that like rolls over and recruits five stars. Um, and and I was not quite there yet. So it's going to be a difficult challenge. The the advanced metrics, just by dint of uh, UConn's talent, you know, sort of have them like the computers think UConn's a, a slight favorite. The betters think Iowa's a slight favorite. So how that all shakes out, like. Is is this really going to are, are there hidden like mismatches on UConn's team just because of their like crazy talent, even if the production's not there yet? Or is the fact that I was playing such great basketball, uh, might get Molly Davis back next weekend. Uh she's it looked like she was walking without a limp, even though that she was out this weekend. Even if they get five to ten minutes out of Molly, the fact that she can take some of that like ball pressure load off of Caitlin just for those few minutes is going to make a world of difference with the way that Iowa matches up with uh, the Huskies. But ultimately um, these teams are very similar. We're, we're talking about uh, Edwards in the middle and then four guards around her and Edwards is six, three. And you look at the other side of the court, Hannah Stulke, six, two, probably uh, it's she's listed at six, two. We'll put it that way. Um, and four guards around her. And it, you know, Oftentimes, Stalky's the only player over six feet tall on the court for Iowa. And, it, and you know, there's going to be a lot of times where Edwards is the only player over six feet tall on the court for UConn. So we're going to see some similar styles. We're going to see two really talented coaches, it, like two of the best ever to stock the sidelines, especially in the 21st century and women's college basketball, point blank. And two of the best guards college basketball has ever seen. I don't know what else anybody could ask for out of this matchup, except maybe a slightly healthier UConn. And I know there's a bunch of Iowa fans who hear that and say, no, more injuries, more. <laughs> so like that is, but that's sort of the level of challenge that's in front of the Hawkeyes. And so if they want to get back to the championship game, which would be incredible, they're going to have to earn it just like they've earned it every step of the way through the tournament thus far. Uh, Ross, anything else that you've got that, that sort of uh, jumps out at you for UConn? Yeah, I think the only other thing I would add is that this UConn team, you know, obviously, you know, they recruited at a phenomenally high level, but I think because of those injuries and, and maybe a few other factors, they don't have the depth that, uh, you know, some of yeah. those great UConn teams of the past have had or that like South Carolina this year certainly has a very deep team with just a lot of just waves of players that can kind of at you. Like UConn doesn't go a whole lot deeper than that starting five. So whatever Iowa can do to, you know, play at their, the temple they want to play at, that Iowa wants to play at, and, you know, UConn probably doesn't. So, you know, try and wear them out, um, you know, tire them out, and if possible, try to get them into foul trouble. Um, that happened against the USC last night, although USC wasn't able to really take advantage of it and, you know, obviously didn't win the game and couldn't foul any of the UConn players out, but uh, Mule, I think, had her fourth foul in the four third quarter and somehow avoided fouling out. So, yeah, if Iowa can, you know, draw fouls, you know, get them playing a little more hesitantly at least or, 
you know, tire them out with, uh, with a fast tempo, that's going to, you know, those are things maybe they can do to try and limit some of that, you know, five-star talent advantage that, that UConn otherwise has. Yes, sir. And our Braden Roberts will have a preview on iowa.rivals.com as we get closer to game day. You can stay tuned to the site for that. He does an excellent job previewing matchups and and more with the games ahead. Is there anything else we need to add regarding Iowa, UConn, women's basketball before we hop out of here? Because I am tired of hearing myself talk, and I'm sure everybody else here is too. <laughs> I, I think we you are a melodious talker, Elliot. Don't sell yourself yes. short. Yeah, much better. Those days I was of say, I coming in clutch here. <laughs> yes, definitely. I was going to say, I think the only thing we didn't mention is that the Iowa game is the second game on Friday. So uh, the South Carolina NC State is the first game that's tipping off at, I believe, is it 6 p.m. Central, I think, on ESPN? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah I, so, Iowa is projected for 8.30 p.m., essentially. Right, so approximately 8.30 start for uh, for Iowa, depending on, you know, however long the first game takes and – ESPN and whatever else happens, but yeah. So expect a oh, uh, expect a know. late I, night. I, I think they'll yeah they'll, they'll get it in in a clean two hours. What are we talking about here? Oh, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> women's, no TV bloat. <laughs> no, I mean two TV hours. timeouts, women's basketball officiating. It, it, it'll all work out just fine, I'm sure. No, no big deal. But just yeah, just no, saying, probably bank on a late night on Friday night for uh, Iowa hoops. Yeah, it's it's uh, gonna be a little bit later. Drink your caffeine, get ready for that game. If you're headed to Cleveland, Ross and I are jealous. Of course, Adam will be there covering the game uh, from the sidelines. So stay tuned on iowa.rivals.com for all your women's basketball coverage. Go ahead and follow Adam on Twitter as well and Braden to, to follow along, not only with women's basketball at Iowa right now, but recruiting for women's basketball at Iowa as well. Addie Deal and more who have committed. You can stay tuned to iowa.rivals.com and their respective Twitter pages to follow women's basketball recruiting. So we will wrap up this episode of Hotcast here. We appreciate you tuning in to us here on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you may be listening. If you're on YouTube, drop a like, drop a comment. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We'd love to have you here. And of course, interact with us on Twitter at Elliot Clough, Adam Jacoby, Ross Binder, all on that website. And if you're not a premium subscriber yet, make sure that you do that as well. Ross, did you have something to add? I did not. I was prematurely waving goodbye. Okay. <laughs> that was your signature like this. Okay. Prematurely waving goodbye. All right. He's ready to get out of here. Before you do. Can, can we just like not taunt Angel Reese, Ross? Come on now. <laughs> Before we get out of here. Do all those things I mentioned. If you're not a premium subscriber yet, make sure you head over to iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe. Join us there. We'd love to have you. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play. Leave that rate and review. We appreciate it a lot, and it makes us very happy. For now, I am Elliot Clough at Elliot Clough on Twitter, and we will see you next time.